and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. A special thanks to our partner, the Poetry Foundation, which has an upcoming visual poetry exhibition, Monica Ong, Planetaria, opening Thursday, April 21st. Wrapping up our 2022 edition of Expo Chicago is the panel, Too Much, Not Enough, Visions of a New Chicago Visual Poetics, and it features poet, performer, and visual artist Krista Franklin and poet Alyssa Moore in conversation with librarian Siobhan McKissick. These artists and librarians will discuss visual practices and poetry, as well as the ways that writers, readers, and artists have shaped unique approaches through cross-disciplinary practices in Chicago and beyond. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, a special thank you to Expo um, for hosting this and having us today. I'm really excited to talk to Krista and Alyssa. Um, and wanted to give a special shout out to Fred Sasaki and Catherine Litwin. Um, although neither of them can be here today, uh, we wanted to acknowledge the work that they do as supporters of programs like this. Um, and if you haven't picked up a copy of your poetry magazine, which these two are heavily featured in, I strongly suggest that you do. So, Alyssa Moore is a visual poet and writer based in Chicago. They hold degrees from Harvard University and the Iowa Writers Workshop, where they were an Iowa Arts Fellow. They were an inaugural winner of Poetry Magazine's Editor's Prize for Visual Poetry and a white writer in residence for Future Poems, Future Feed. Their work has appeared in Poetry, uh, Boston Review, Hyperallergic, Tag Varic, and elsewhere. They're an editor of Ghost Proposal, a journal for visual poetry and work that transcends or sits outside of traditional norms of genre. Krista Franklin uh, is a writer and visual artist, uh, the author of Too Much Midnight, the artist book Under the Knife, and the chapbook Study of Love and Black Body. She's a Helen and Tim Meyer Foundation for the Arts Achievement Awardee and the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. Her visual art is exhibited at the Poetry Foundation, Constell C. Rootwork, uh, Rootwork Gallery, uh, Museum of Contemporary Photography, Studio Museum in Harlem, Chicago Cultural Center, National Museum of Mexican Art, and the set of 20th Century Fox's Empire. She's been published in Poetry, Black Camera, The Offing, Vinyl, and a number of anthologies and artist books. Uh, she'll also have an exhibition and publication called Solos at the DePaul Art Museum that opens this fall on September 8th and will work in the O'Hare Terminal 5 Expansion Public Art Project. <laughs> so in this conversation about visual poetics, um, uh, my, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview. So myself and April Sheridan, uh, another librarian at the School of the Art Institute, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us, um, we worked together to create a, an exhibit that featured a host of visual poetics, uh, drawing on these timelines and heritages that both of you are so deeply a part of. Um, a little bit of history about visual poetics. Um, when we think about this, uh, visual poetics go back incredibly far, as far back as, uh, gr as, as Greek history, where people were putting vi visual poetry on buildings, sculptures, and really incorporating that work into um, everything around them, pottery, everything like that. When most of us think about visual poetry, we think about the work of the 20, 20th century, but can also go as far back as the Renaissance. And uh, a variety of different um, revolutions that have occurred in the art movement. In the 1950s, the musician Sun Ra was standing on Chicago street corners giving out paper-based interplanetary propaganda, which set off so much joy. In the 1960s, Dig Higgins was talking about intermedia and Emmett Williams was talking about concrete poetry. Deciding what their work should look like on a page um, and they circled back to all kinds of work of Amiri Baraka 
and um, a number of different musicians. Musicians, dancers, poets were all working together to figure out a way to create um, the stories of their lives, to figure out ways that they could combine the forms that they worked in and really try to figure out a way to express. Um, and they often couldn't do that with just one form. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the different ways that Krista and Alyssa um, have uh, figured out how to incorporate multiple genres in their work. So the first question I have is, what is your concept of visual poetics? And how has that influenced your practice? And how have you even thought about this? Hello. Hi, y'all. You OK? So quiet and polite. Good for you. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, so we're talking about the concepts, right? The concept of visual poetry. You know, I have a very broad understanding of the visual poetry because of the way that I kind of came in. I always come in through back doors, you know, of things. So, you know, the way that I kind of came into visual poetry was through a magazine, a publication called Rattle. And Rattle in 2008 did an issue called uh, The Visual Poetry Issue. And they invited me to submit some work, and so I did. And it was collages, so they published two collages. And I was like, well, how is that poetry? You know what I mean? I was really kind of confused about it, but at the same time embraced it because I understand that the work that I was making visually also engaged a lot of writing and engaged text, right? So I figured that, you know, when we're talking about visual poetry, we're talking about work that somehow incorporates image and text, you know, it can be very dynamic. That's a very broad, right, um, definition because that can come in so many different forms, right? It can come in like diagram form, you know, I'm thinking about probably the first time I saw visual poetry in my life was um, doing sentence diagrams in elementary school. You guys remember those? Nobody remembers those. I love sentence diagrams. Like five people in here remember those, five people. Sentence diagrams were my jam. And I really was into just the lines and I was very meticulous about making those lines and you know what I mean? So I think that probably my first impression of visual poetry was that in my imagination as a kid, you know? But it's, it, to me it's very broad, but it's image and text. Yeah, my definition is similarly broad um, just because I think like it, it's so contextual, right? Like what is art, like what is this kind of like line that you're drawing between, and especially a lot of the examples that we have like looping, like what is the line between like, is this poetry or is it not? And I think kind of like the context of where it's presented helps you to begin to define, right? Because there's so many things that kind of like fall into that category. There's like poetry comics and then, you know, um, <laughs> like collages, um, there, there are so many things. We could just be like sitting here listing for a long time. But one thing that I, or a couple of things, um, I think kind of like generally as a like really broad like categorization kind of thing, um, I kind of think of poetry that kind of resists typical the typical structure, like, you know, trying to divide words into, like, stanzas and anything kind of, like, visual happening on the page that's, like, drawing you to, like, actually look and kind of, like, disrupting the stanza format or kind of whatever, I think begins to fall in that visual poetry um, category. And, so like, some of the examples that I put in here are, like, digital, more people who are working in, like, kind of, like, digital poetry, digital poetics, whatever that means. Um, and I think a big part of that as well, like thinking about like how this is categorized, um, a lot of those people who are doing that are really interested in like representation and like um, trying to not be legible, like not, like it's not as important to be like trying to um, kind of like push against the traditional like poetic institutions and be really not legible, um, which I think for me was one of the ways that I like first started like actually engaging with like visual poetry. Um, 
So there's kind of like this idea of like not wanting to be legible for people who are like, I want to read a confessional poem, I want to read a narrative poem. And it's like against that. And also because you're resisting legibility, there's also the sense of like um, also resisting kind of parallel to that like surveillance or something else, right? Like this is um, trying to move away from just like very like narrative or whatever kind of lyrical forms. Um, and I actually, <laughs> I brought a quote by one of my friends who, who does a lot of visual poetry and um, I don't know how many like poets are in the audience, but there's kind of like this idea that a lot of poets, I feel like we love poetry and we hate it at the same time. And you know, not necessarily, I think, like, there, one part of that is that language often fails, and it's really hard to use language to say what you mean. And another part of that is, like, institutions and, you know, your work and all of that. Um, but this quote, um, which totally was just a text that my friend sent me a long time ago, and I'm like, this is relevant, uh, is... Poetics is so fucked that you leave language entirely and make language some kind of artifact that falls apart all over an image. And some of their work is in here. Um, but so thinking of this idea of like moving away from um, both like trying to find a way to be legible to oneself and also not be legible to others and also make connections, I think, with people who are also trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I really like the way that you talk about these different kinds of connections. Um, and quite frankly, I'm really interested in the kinds of connections that you all have made, uh, both with poets, uh, other artists, musicians. You know, everyone was sort of doing this in the 1960s and forever. Um, but what are, the, what are the other people that you feel have created, like, a lineage for you? Um, and how have they impacted the kinds of work that you're making or thinking about it? I mean, my lineages are very broad. You know, I think when, when we talked about this before I had to really sit down and map, you know, um, who are my lineages in, in visual poetry, right? And some of, I mean, some of them are very common, you know, folks like William Burroughs, you know? Um, you know, I, I, uh, David Bowie, you know, is, is a big influence on me visual poetry wise. I also would say FBI Cointel Pro on the Black Panther Party. Yeah. That was my first introduction to erasure. It was my first introduction to the idea of suppression of information. It was my first exposure. I was, it was, you know, I was at Kent State University in the 90s, so, you know. And it was really, um, you know, it was, it was really ultra black, you know. And, you know, we were really into the politics. And it was, it was the Cointel profiles, you know, on the F, on, you know, that they were keeping and tracking. So when we talk about surveillance, right? Surveillance culture being a part of visual poetry aesthetics as well, right? Like what we can read, what we can't read, le legibility, illegibility, you know, what's available to, what you can see, what you can't see, you know, um, that just jacked my head up, you know? And then, you know, the, like, like again with, you know, Burroughs and Brian Guys, and it has to do with like the cut up method, you know, I got from them and, um, you know, so some of those are some of my methodologies, you know, and some of the people that, that are in my visual poetry lineage. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's it. I also would say, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the man that we always talk about, but in a different way, you know. Um, and I thought about writers, I thought about graffiti writers, you know, I thought about writers, uh, and I thought about Basquiat and his, you know, the introduction of Samo as this character who was writing text on walls, right? So, I mean, that was his introduction into the world, right? Was, you know, visually was writing words that were very stylistic, right? So that to me is also visual poetry and it definitely influenced, you know, my thinking around what writing is, you know? Yeah, so I think thinking about like how we both arrived to this work, like for me, it was not as, and I, I think you, you got at this as well, Krista, it wasn't like, well, except for the rattle example. <laughs> we didn't just like pick something up and then it's like, oh, this is visual poetry, I need to be doing this. And it wasn't like that for me either. It was like, um, 
the experimentation of poets generally, like there are so many poets, poets are extremely experimental, right? And it's not necessarily, um, not necessarily poets who are specifically working with visual styles, but still like poets that for me, um, like Bernadette Mayer, like Gertrude Stein, who like unlocked in my brain, like the page is a place of experiment and play and anything can happen here and it doesn't have to be stanza and I love stanzas. <laughs> Nothing against stanzas. Um, but <laughs> But this is like this is a this is a place where anything can happen, and you know I think um, kind of being within kind of like institutions where I think everyone is trying to achieve some sort of aesthetic, whatever that is, um, generally like more traditional aesthetics, whatever. But I feel like that sort of pressure for me was what pushed me towards like I need to be I need to be playing more on the page, right? Um, so yeah, that I think that yeah, that's, that's how I arrived here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like play is so important uh, in the ways that, especially because both of you are just sort of playing all over genre. <laughs> um, but I'm also really interested in like how has the different technologies that you've been able to encounter um, allowed you to play more, allowed you to sort of expand the way you think about your stanzas, uh, the shape of your work. Uh, the ways that you um, keep things, you withhold things from your readers and your viewers? Yeah, I love this question because I feel like um, there are, and I'm kind of more specifically talking about people who are, or my context where I'm starting and thinking about is like people who are working with like different digital mediums to like create poems. Um, and, you know, whether that be, like, I'm making something, well, perfect, it's <laughs> like an Instagram story, right? Like, how can I use that to make a visual poem? Um, or, I don't know, like, PowerPoint, a Twine game. Um, I am, like, running out of examples. Microsoft Paint. <laughs> sure, yeah. Like, there's so many different things. And it opens up this, like, multiple different languages that poets can draw from to then make poems. Um, so it just kind of becomes like really limitless and like boundless, like what you can do in terms of, you know, like what is the, like how does this app function and how can I use the languages of this app or like the functionalities of this app to then make a poem and then to also say something about what it means to like be living in this world where I'm using all of these apps and like how do I capture that moment. Um, and I know that we're probably gonna talk about archiving <laughs> later, but also there's this part of it where it's like, not only does it expand the language of like what you can do and create on the page, but also it's an opportunity to kind of like archive like what is happening and how we're like being moved and changed by all of these like digital technologies that we're always interacting with. Um, yeah. I wanted you to start that because you know what I'm gonna say. You know, I'm an analog girl in a digital world like Miss Badu, and I, I just, I really, you know, it's so funny because, you know, I'm like the anti-technology Afrofuturist. You know what I'm saying? Which is completely an oxymoron. So the biggest technologies that I use are, you know, scissors and glue. You know what I mean? Those are my technologies. And so I feel like, you know, in, in some ways, the technologies that are available to me, I almost resist them in, in, in the attempts to try to make myself the machine, you know, um, to generate... And, and figure out ways of uh, doing interventions, rupture, you know, those are things that are really important to me, right, and thematically in my work, you know, thinking about how I can intervene on something, how I can, you know, disrupt the space um, or, or scatter the space, right, scatter words on the page, like how does the, how does the arrangement of the page look, you know, the page as canvas, yeah? So I think a lot of times the technology eludes me because I'm not, you know, tapped into those kinds of technologies. I'm very much an analog girl. I think the thing that you said about, like, resisting, like, you're resisting the technology and something that 
I feel like happens when poets do work within the technologies, <laughs> within the technologies, when they like work within them to like create poems, especially like we were talking about surveillance as well. Like there is something that's very like antagonistic, right? Like there's some sort of like, there's this weird relationship, right? Cause we know like these are these <laughs> platforms are just like collecting data about us, but we're trying to use it to like then kind of like transform it, right, shape it to be a medium to translate something that we're trying to say, right? So there is still, I feel like, you're very like literally resisting it, but even um, in some of the work that's like up here, like there is still that relationship of like resisting. Uh, in that resistance and uh, uh, to be clear, I have been an archivist for like seven years now, so I'm going to ask my lame little archivist questions. <laughs> um, but I'm really interested in how both of you think about the ways that your work will be saved into the future. Um, whether working in analog or working in more digital formats, there are some very real implications um, for how that gets saved. So are you thinking about how your work is going to go into the future? No. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. Please do. Uh, no. no. I mean, to a to a degree, you know. I I think you know. To me, the digital, the capturing, right, the the documentation, right, which is I guess is as digital as I get. The documentation of the work, right, is the part of the archive. You know, what can be saved, right? You know, if the if the computers all decided tomorrow to you know just die, then that those you know those files are gone, right? Um, I don't think too much about it because I was self I self I was self taught, you know, for many, many years, you know, until I was like, you know, about to be forty. So I didn't even consider like I didn't even know what acid free paper was until I was like in my forties. You know what I mean? And I was making like I was making collages like prolifically. So you know, there for me the idea of deterioration is something that I embrace simply because I think that you know, as living beings, we have beginnings and ends, right? You know, everything has a beginning, everything has an end, none of us get out of this alive. So, you know, for me, it's almost weird to think about something lasting forever, even though I know that that's um, a goal of the art world, that's a goal of the literary world, right? That you wanna live forever. I'm thinking about fame, I wanna live forever. Right, you know, it's that shit. So I feel like, you know, um, I don't really think, I don't think about it too much, nah. You know, I just make the work, and if it's supposed to last for a while, and it'll last for a while, Yonita, you know, Yonita knows how I do my, my artwork. She's like, stop handling it like that. You know, so yeah, I don't think too much about it. Yeah, no. I think uh, also, I feel like you, you just said this, but I feel like a lot of poets and artists that I know are making so much all the time that it's like, you know, if one of the things rises above the rest, you know, it's, it's just part of the, this work in particular is like figuring it out as you go. Um, and a lot of things get lost and some things don't get lost, but um, I feel like that moment and like some of the poems here, which were like screenshots of my desktop, it was almost like what was important for me there, like, well, one, like curation is really important, but then like capturing the, that moment. So like the moment of the poem is like kind of like the archive that's happening, but actually kind of carrying that and like worrying about the future, maybe not, but like in this moment, like that is what's happening. So it, it so it's like kind of like a momentary thing versus like long term goal, end goal, you know, future thing. Although this makes me very sad <laughs> because this is the thing that I do all day <laughs> is figure out ways to save everyone's work. I'm a little devastated. <laughs> But I think it's really important that both of you are intentional about it, because um, a lot of people, it is a whole accident that they simply never thought of um, and never incorporated, because the work that you're making is going to deteriorate in one way, and then 
in the process of you making digital work, we still, uh, as a field, have not quite figured out how to preserve digital work long enough. Um, even still, like we, you got like ten years uh, for a lot of material. The only one that actually lasts a long time is uh, like film. <laughs> That's the only one we figured out how to get to last for like a hundred years. Um, whether people want us to keep it there or not. But <laughs> um, even though you're not thinking about the ways that you archive your own work, I am also interested in the archives of other people that you have drawn from. Because I know you've done a lot of stuff around Sun Ra um, and around Octavia Butler. Uh, and there are these, all these archives that you all are looking at uh, as you create. So how are you using other people's? I'm using a lot of the archive. You know, black black publications in particular, right, um, hold a really, really special place in my heart. You know, literary publications to magazines to, you know, any kind of printed matter from, from these older eras, right, that kind of track um, black experience, black life, you know. So I, I'm usually into, you know, thinking about the thrift store as a space of an archive, right? Thinking about the body even as an archive, right? My own body as an archive, you know, the bodies of the people around me as holding all of this information, right, that I have access to while they're here, you know? Um, so I'm constantly in, in and out of the archive, both libraries as well as thrift stores, you know, antique stores, you know, that kind of thing. I remember when I lived in Dayton, which is where I'm from, Dayton, Ohio, I used to frequent all of these um, vintage stores, you know? And I stumbled into one of them one time in the Oregon District, and there was this incredible wealth of, like, photographs, old, like, antique photographs of black folks that I'm sure they were just, like, state, state, state sale, right, images, but they just rocked my world, you know what I mean? And I would just go in there from time to time and you know, buy up as much as I could, you know, as a little broke 20 year old, you know, trying to get as much as I could from that. Because I just felt like it was so rich, you know, it has so much history to it. And these people that I didn't know, but their expressions were just so precious to me, you know, and, and where they were at that time, how did they survive those times? You know what I mean? And still be smiling in these, in these photographs. So, you know, the archive is, is huge in my work, you know, pulling from old stuff. And of course, you know, being in Chicago, you know, you, I, you know, black artists in general just tend to be very attracted to the Johnson Publishing Company archive, you know, and for for great reason, right? It's very, it's rich. It's a rich, wealthy, wealthy source. So, um, you know, Jet and Ebony, you know, are big for me, but as are, you know, many publications, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, in another kind of like related sense, there's also all of this personal data, kind of like accumulation of personal stuff too. Like that's what I'm pulling from. Like that would be my archive, you know? And like trying to repurpose like the life stuff that just accumulates and then, you know, this all this digital data and presence, presences and kind of like identities and trying to make something out of that, um, yeah. I'm also just, are there any things that you all collect uh, personally that you use in your work that happen to, no. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yes, maybe. Yes. Lots of albums, lots of albums, you know, lots of vinyl. Um, you know, I have a series where I actually pulp um, album covers down, you know, called the Heavy Rotation series, and I just pulp down the album covers and turn them into handmade paper. So, you know, yeah, the, you know, there's, there's a, bunch of, a bunch of different things that I collect, you know, um, from magazines to old books to albums to, you know, just about anything that attracts me um, visually to it, you know, it could be even like a color. I have a great collection of library cards that were given to me from a friend, so yeah, all of that. Nah, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Um, but I am really interested because, uh, Alyssa, you talked a little bit about um, the role of curation in a lot of the work that you make. And you know, I'm super fascinated because your particular work sort of um, frames like a specific moment and how you were thinking about the way that all of these different things work together. 
um, these different videos, these different images, um, little little thumbnails of whatever you had on your desktop and how they interact with the written poetry. Um, so I'm also really, I want to know how you will think about the process of making and how do you find a sort of freedom in that uh, process? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do have an answer to this question. Do you think about it though in like revision process? Like do you think about it like after, it's on the, after you've kind of accumulated whatever the information is that you're going to use for the poem or for the piece, then kind of the curation of that yeah, so sorry, my, so the poems that you're mentioning in particular are kind of interesting because kind of like the, the curation that I was talking about was like really trying to capture a couple things. So one, like the moment of like the inception of the poem or something, right? And so that meant a couple of things. Um, one trying to resist this pressure to be perfect and to present like a perfect piece of art. <laughs> and that in particular is important to me as a black person because, um, you know, there is this pressure to do everything perfectly to be able to be, you know, received or whatever. Um, and so kind of like the curation there was like trying to capture mistakes and like trying to capture this moment where, you know, <laughs> like whatever happened in like the first kind of like moment of like writing the poem and arranging the things, that's what the poem is. Um, so, but, but also underneath that, like that's kind of like not true because still here I am, the artist creating that collage that has its like mistakes in it or whatever. But also I'm like, I'm arranging the whole thing. Like I'm, you know, I'm making it what it's gonna be. Um, so yeah, like that, like that part of like just curating this like imperfect landscape that also was like, Another thing that was really important for me is like, I, 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 I don't know if we're gonna share or read poems, but um, my work is pretty surreal and kind of part of the project was resisting, um, or kind of, I am not, I'm not a poet that's like giving you everything. I'm not like a, I'm not a confessional poet. <laughs> but in this project, part of what I was trying to do was like overwhelm the reader with like all of this information. It's like, okay, there is this kind of pressure to be really grounded in the real world and not be surreal in poems, whatever. Um, so part of that project was like, overwhelming with all of this personal information, you know, because it's like, it's a screenshot of the desktop. These are kind of like our personal spaces that we're not really sharing with other people generally, right? Like your personal laptop or whatever. Um, and creating this space where it's like so overwhelming, like there's information from like end to end, right? There's images, there's, um, there's poems, there's, there's so much stuff. It's overwhelming, <laughs> you know? And it also is kind of like a snapshot of like probably how most people are like engaging with their kind of like digital space generally. Like it's a mess. There's so much stuff there. Uh, and so trying to, so like for me curating was like those kind of impulses, like those were the impulses like driving it. Um, and that sense of like over, overwhelm was like really important and really a, a big driving factor too. Yeah, I think in my process with my visual poems, I'm almost doing the opposite in some ways. I'm like creating all of this space, you know, like trying to, you know, create space, you know, in, in these spaces of like overwhelming, you know what I mean? Of feeling overwhelmed and bombarded, you know? So that's, yeah, that's, I didn't even think about that until just now thinking about your process. I mean, process for me is very laborious, you know, so it's not something that I think I'd spend a lot of time thinking about because it's not sometimes what I enjoy. You know, I really enjoy the revision. You know, that's where I really get excited and turned on is like when I have some things on the page and then I'm able to start to manipulate them in the way, in the order that I want them to be in, you know. Um, that's, that's to me is where like the joy and the heart and the soul of the thing is, you know, as far as like, you know, 
pushing that thing out. That's not exciting to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like trying to find the right words, the right phrases, the right, you know what I mean? Like really kind of pushing against that idea of perfection, you know, um, and the critic, you know, the internal critic, you know, it's like always a battle, you know, a psychic battle that's happening, you know, for me um, in the creative process. So yeah, it's, it's not something that I tend to even think too much about in that way. I love that. <laughs> I really do. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why I wanted both of you to read a little bit of your work is because um, a, really important a, a really important aspect of visual poetry is not just what's on a page, um, but also in the performance of it, in the movement of it. And I'm always interested in the ways that how do you how do you take the shape of the what you put on the page, the stuff that isn't words, um, and reflect that in how you present your work uh, off the page? You want to start? Sure. Are you reading? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Okay, I'm reading something that is part of the work that's looping behind us. Black Rapunzel Broadcasting Live from America's Next Best Value Inn slash list of people with whom I've slept. No one when I was the princess wanted to cut my hair, but everyone wanted to relax it for a fee. No one quite knew what to give me. Who was I? They needed to know, even with the floor plan, even after hours of rustling about my tower with slender, pale arms. The alarm clock held nothing but digits. I was full grown, but I grew taller. My follicles com conferenced with the rafters. The beams attempted to keep me in check. I stood still for a moment with a disembodied suitor and my hair did all the growing. Downward, downward, down. Kidding, I wasn't Rapunzel. I was growing this luxurious kink, this mane. Upward, upward, up and out. The outline surpassed the frame of the dirty mirror in the water closet. Each strand embraced its sister. Some suitors gathered near my raincoats and spit out a variety of straightening products, though of course, all the while, they were looking at my ass. I said that because I felt I should include the reaction of the crowd for the reader's benefit, so they can know what kind of mood the story's attempting. I could care less. Also, am I caring? I spent hours detangling my hairs. I got so horny thinking about who would have my babies because I have royal blood and I want it to continue. So I'm going to read something that is in Too Much Midnight. It's, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would necessarily qualify this as one of my visual poems. I mean, to a degree it is because it plays off of, you know, um, encyclopedia uh, forms or um, dictionary forms, you know. So I think, you know, visually it's, it's kind of designed to resemble, you know, like an entry in, a, in an encyclopedia or an entry in, you know, a dictionary. Um, but most, I would say that most of the, the visual poems that I, that are like appear in, in Under the Knife, you know, were never meant to be read out loud, you know. Um, and I, you know, I do read from it occasionally, that, that text, but it's not something that I lean towards reading out loud because I feel like people should engage that themselves, right? That's the, you know, we don't, it's like reading a painting, you know what I mean? Like, you know. Just go and figure it out. Figure it out for yourself. You know how how you enter it. You know however you enter it is the right way. There's no wrong way to enter it. So I'm gonna read um, uh, this poem. Definition of funk. Let me see if I have it in me to finish this poem. For those of those of y'all who've heard this poem before, you know it's it's active. Definition of funk. Funk, as in pee, as in stank, as in doo-doo, as in ooh-wee, 
as in a good thing gone bad in the dark corner of one cold location like a frigidaire or a once flooded moldy basement. Funk, as in a foul odor, as in a dejected mood, as in cowering fear, as in pheromones dispensed from a running body running through dark woods tracked by bloodhounds, as in we's free. And a pungent confusion of that ominous realization, as in the cellular memory of the scent of wet wood of an auction block, or the smelly sound of a mother moaning in a dark cabin, her babies hauled off in a rickety wagon, funk. As in a style of R&B music, as in a bass line that travels from point A to point B. A as in antebellum or Africa to B as in black or brown, comma, James. Or a bass line that travels from point A to point B. A as in abolitionists or Abernathy, comma, Ralph David to B as in black exploitation or Baraka, comma, Amiri or Bootsy, Collins, Funk. As in, make my funk the P-funk. I wants to get funked up. As in, I don't know, but whatsoever it is, it gots to be funky. Funk, as in 1970s Ohio, as in British Rod Temperton walking off right Pat Air Force Base right into Dayton's west side, as in a grown man named Sugarfoot, as in a pot of chitlins bubbling on some black woman's stovetop, or a saxophone in the mouth of a man named Maceo. Funk. As in electrified organ, as in Edison meet Hammond, as in pounding pigskin, as in foot stomp on the wet wood of an elevated platform, as in platforms, as in stank swamp water, black lagoon backwash, dandelion moonshine distilled in the backyard of some black woman's bungalow, as in syncopated sad mouth, high on the voltage of freedom and an audacious idea of owning yourself funk. As in crawling up out the pit of hell with shattered pants smelling like fire and brimstone. As in black boy's fingers strumming the silky red hen of a siren. Or as in hi-hats or old women's warnings that a body that refuses to be owned often ends up at the dangling end of a rope in the most beautiful sycamore ever. As in the smelly sizzle of hot combs and hair grease. As in crossroads between hell and here or between Kentucky and Ohio, as in juju, root worker dust that flowers in the hearts of men who run amok, women who press their luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's just a really absolutely beautiful way to end this, just having both of you um, share your work with us. So uh, at this point, I would like to open up to questions. Does anyone have any fun little things they want to ask? Oh, I see a hand over there. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Angela Davis Vegan, and my question is for Krista. Um, do you not consider the way that you as a teaching artist is like literally downloading ideas into young people's minds and being part of the archive, or that your tendency towards publishing um, is another way of like distributing this multiple so that you become part of so many people's libraries beyond one location? Like that your legacy is projected forward in continuum? Yes and no. <laughs> One is that I'm not that vain <laughs> to think that I have the kind of impact, right, in that way. So, you know, it's not something that I'm consciously thinking about. Um, I love your articulation of it, Angela. Thank you for that because um, it is a validation. You know, it is a validation to think about it in that way. I definitely think that, um, you know, like Stevie Wonder, children are the future. So, you know, them really holding information that I might, you know, share with them or, like you said, download into them, you know, when we're in each other's company, that means a lot to me. However they take that information and help themselves to shape the world that they're going to live in, I'm with that. You know what I mean? Like, I always tell them, like, listen, I'm a dinosaur. You know what I'm saying? I'm on my way, I'm on my way out of this bitch. So, you know, good, good luck. You know what I mean? Like, I can give you as much information as I can, you know, to try to survive this shit, but you know what I mean? Like, I'm still trying to do it myself. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, yes and no to that 
question. I think on my, you know, my most egomaniac Kanye West days, yeah, you know? Sure. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is for Alyssa. I've noticed that in a lot of your art, there's like, you know, it's spatially active. Like, there's ones where the words are kind of literally falling down the page and other ones where they're sort of slashed over. And I just wonder how, like, how does, like, the idea of, like, you know, sp I don't know, spatiality and, like, movement, like, inform your art? Like, is it something that you, like, consider a lot? Or does it, like, drive you in, in what you're doing? Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I think that, like, that part... Um, I think like I said earlier, like the experimentation of poets, like I don't think that necessarily, like that didn't just appear into my mind, right? But um, like a lot of the work of a lot of like language poets and kind of like what they're doing on the page, kind of, I mean like literally, I don't, I don't, again, I don't know how many people are poets in this room, but like moving from, and like only kind of working in, you know, with words and then just literally seeing, like I can remember when I like first saw like, the words are different sizes on the page. Like that sounds so silly, but like, and even, you know, some of these things might seem like, oh, well, you know, this is like, it's visual art, like, of course, like, whatever. But, like, the way that, like, your brain just goes, Phew. oh, yeah, I can do all of these things, right? Like, I can move the words. And because poets are so, like, you have to use all of your senses, I feel like, to write poems. And so when you encounter poems where, like, things are moving, like, that is a very visceral sensation in your body. And I feel like explaining that like I said like it sounds silly and like crazy it's like okay the words are sideways like whatever but it's but it's not it's like that is attempting to like create some sensation and I um so that was not an answer to your question no, I think it's I think it's, it's getting there yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about how like you know that what you said about like using all of your senses to make a poem sort of that like resistance that y'all were talking about, you know, where like a poem is sort of just meant to be read and meant to be heard rather than like engaged with and like, you know, like not just like context, but like texture itself is is, is present in the poem. I was just like, oh, that's, that's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's great. It's another layer. It's great. <laughs> you get it. Um, I was thinking about that comment, uh, Krista, that you made earlier about um, being originally influenced by FBI like um, documents, and I, as soon as you said that, I can visually see like a redacted document or like a, a declassified document, and, and just like that visual representation and, and what it means when you're reading that and you're something from 60 years ago is being revealed and you remember that forever. Um, so I was wondering about your experience to those original um, references for you know non poetry um, inputs that that like propelled you into this into this work. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can um, clearly articulate that line. You know, I feel like American politics, specifically, you know, American politics that were shady underhanded, you know, um, sketchy, <laughs> have an appeal to me, you know? So I think even in undergrad, when I came across those documents, I remember feeling a great sense of frustration and a great sense of anger because, you know, there, you really can't read it. It's illegible, you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't really decipher what really is what they're watching or what they're doing because everything that's important to the document has been taken out, you know what I mean? So. I think in some ways it helped me and it, it helped me a lot when I was creating Under the Knife because, you know, Under the Knife was really my story and I wanted to, there were some things that I wanted to obscure. There were things that I wanted to hide. There were things that I wanted to remain classified, right? Um, or wanted to make the, work, the reader work 
to try to figure out what was happening, you know? And I also used the redaction in that text to kind of, um, to, to demonstrate erasure, erasure of memory, my memory, I have a really bad memory, you know? So it's like, some of it is just like gestures about the erasure of memory, historical as well as personal memory, you know? So I think that those, and that those, I mean, you're right, those, those files are very, um, memorable. You know, once you start reading them and going through them, you can't stop thinking about just how they look structurally on the page, right? The scaffolding of words that's being created and the power of those, the power dynamic of what's left and what's, what's been erased. You know what I mean? So I feel like, I don't know if I necessarily have a direct lineage to like help you understand like, you know, how those, how those, those documents influence my thinking but they did on, a, on multiple levels, not just as an artist, but as a human being, as a black human being walking in the world, right? That also I could be watched, I could be surveilled in that way that, you know, my sense of personhood was, became very destabilized. You know what I mean? So I think in that sense too, wanting the words on the page to create a sense of destabilization, that because that's the mentality that I think a lot of us live under in this society. You know? So I hope that answers your question to some degree. Yeah, it's a little, I mean, I feel like it's still so impressionistic in my mind to even articulate the, the real impact of those documents, you know, on my psyche. <laughs> but I think even the sense of like, now this is something that's in my toolbox, yes. right? Like, I don't have to show everything or tell everything no. and also like, really co-opting, right? Like these really violent practices exactly. for whatever you're doing with your art. It's like, yeah. That's totally it. Thank you. Um, I, have, I just have a like quick question. Um, since like uh, one of them um, what, um, talked about Afrofuturism, I was wondering about like, there's like so much freedom that we can have like with the format of Afrofuturism. Like um, it could be like, you know, art or expression like could be interpreted in the sound and movement and words and, you know, etc. And then I wonder like, what do you guys think about like how it's in in interpreted in different audience? You know, not the audience that you guys targeting or directing, but the different audience. Because that's just like personally struggling with right now. So I just like wondering. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I think I'm still having confusion about yeah. the question. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Um, so as much as we have a lot of freedom of the format and then how we expressing, you know, our identity and also like the, our creation, you know, creativity. I was just like wondering, like, as much as we have like much like freedom, like also like there's a lot of um, people like who are, you know, receiving and, you know, like, um, you know, interpreting a lot of different way. So like, how you guys like kind of uh, manage or kind of like mediate in between of those gaps? I don't know. I I don't try to do that work. You can't really. I I feel like once it's on the page, it's out there. Like it's whatever relationship, whatever you get from it as a reader or someone interacting with it, just kind of is. I don't really try to try to do that work. I, I feel like that would drive you crazy if you did. I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know how to answer that question, really. You know what I mean? Besides, you have to have your own, like, intention. You know, you have to have your own reason. I think even I, I have a very love-hate relationship with, with Afrofuturism right now, you know? That's because I've known about Afrofuturism for a really, really long time. And then once it came, once things come into the public eye, I kind of start to lose interest. Because I don't like the mainstream. I think, I don't know. So I get real, you know, sketchy about that. But I just feel like, you know, you just make the work that, you know, the reason that so, sometimes I call some of my work Afrofuturist is because I'm, do, I'm using science fiction concepts. 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's because I'm tied into science fiction films and novels, right? So a lot of my work kind of in some way is mimicking a lot of the things that I saw growing up in sci-fi world, right? Um, so I don't know. That's, that's a tough one for me. I don't... Because I think a lot of times people are calling stuff Afrofuturist, and I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing, you know? But by all means, you know what I mean? Like, if you want to, if that label helps you in some way to articulate what you're trying to do, then jump in it. You know what I mean? But I think that also research what that is. Don't just use a word because it sounds cool or because it's trendy. You know what I'm saying? Like, really, is your work doing that? That this, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of, you know, writings that have been done over the years that I think have not been read. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I just have a, I have a weird reaction, I think, to that. I just say, focus on what you're trying to do. You know, don't worry about what everybody else is trying to make you do or what you feel like this pressure to make. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I try not to think too much about other people. It's like too confusing. That's fair. I really think it actually speaks quite uh, a bit to the conversation that y'all were having earlier about um, the pressure of perfection. There's absolutely nothing that you can do to make sure that everyone is going to get the exact same thing out of the work that you do. Uh, everyone's going to take their own thing. Everyone's going to interpret it completely differently than the way that you are, especially when you're trying to overwhelm people <laughs> with your work, especially when you're trying to like condense um, for people like a single moment or a feeling. Um, there really isn't much you can do. Y'all can just put it out there and hope for the best. <laughs> or the worst. Um, <laughs> hope that something uh, will reach people. So. Any more shy people? There you are. Thanks through your hard drive and giving it back to us. And I feel like your so much of your work is an archive and your poems are archiving so much through your experience and through your spirit and through your ritual. And I just really want to appreciate you on your archival work. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. That was a really uh, great last statement. So. Uh, thank you all so much for coming uh, to here. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you so much, Krista. Uh, it's been an honor. Thank you, Siobhan. <laughs> it's been thank y'all so much for being here, too. It's a beautiful day. I don't even know why y'all in here. <laughs> why are you in here? Make sauce. Enjoy. Thank y'all so much for coming. Well, have a good day. Perfect.